Hello, welcome to Renegade Investor TV. This week we've got a very special episode because I'm joined by arguably the best known investment expert in the UK, Justin Urquhart Stewart from Seven Investment Management. Justin. Welcome to Renegade Investor TV. Graham, what a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Great stuff. Lovely to have you here. Could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you, how you ended up being this sort of really well-known investment expert? I think probably by mistake. I'd like to say there was a master plan behind it, yeah. uh, but no, not really. No, we had uh, developed our business uh, over the years, and it's coming through, there's a sort of illogical history going through all the areas you have to learn going back pre-Big Bang in the days of you know, jobbers and brokers, um, and then learning how not to do it when we had BZW, Bar Barclays de Zoot Wed, which mm. was a fiasco. Um, and then we formed a business called Broker Services. Actually, we based that in Glasgow. Mm. That was a Big Bang when everything in the city, of course, was just going mad and money was no, no object because mm. the city had been dominated suddenly by the big American banks coming in. And everything changed from being mm. partnerships, where it was your responsibility, mm. to when it was then corporates owning it. Therefore, it's a shareholder's responsibility. And who cares about shareholders? And so they were spending money willy nilly. Mm. So we set up a business in Glasgow where we, could have a, we had a Glasgow stock exchange. You could actually do your settlements done properly, and the whole cost of operation was cheaper, mm. and build it from there. And it was only when Barclays came in and bought that business, and that became Barclays Stockbrokers, and they actually took away my entire marketing budget. And so there was only one thing to do then, which was actually we had managed to purloin, I won't tell you how we got hold of it, a, a television camera mm. from BZW when they shut it down. And we, it took us ages to connect it up because BT was moving fast. Um, and we, when we finally got it connected, we phoned up, I think it was Bloomberg or CNBC, and said, do you want a market report? Mm. And they said, yes. So that's how it all started. Fantastic. Someone cancels your marketing budget, find another way of doing it. Brilliant, brilliant. So, so all these years later, you know, you, you've been around the markets a long time. What, what do you really still enjoy? What do you still get a buzz from about the work you do? The buzz is actually, and it, 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 is, it doesn't change, it's actually dealing with clients uh, and their advisors yeah. about actually demystifying, clarifying things. And you, hear, you can see light bulbs going on where people go, really? Mm. Is that what happens? How do I get wealthier? How do I get financially secure? Yeah. Our industry has been appalling in terms of we've built a fantastic industry at serving our industry mm. and not serving the clients. It's their money, not ours. Mm. You know, it's a privilege to look after people's money. When you get it right, and people will consider and say, not that you were the best investment person in the world, but you made money for them steadily over time, mm. and they're relieved, they're comforted, they've got some confidence. And if you can do that, that gives me a hell of a buzz. Okay, but I mean, one of the things that <clears throat> I'm always banging the drum about, and I find it so hard sometimes to get through, is so many people have so little interest in their financial future. Mm. You know, you're always up against this kind of indifference. Uh, uh, why do you think it is that so people just seem to care so little about finances? Well, is it care or they're just so frightened of it? That if mm. I just, I'm frightened of it, I, I'm just I'm not going to deal with it, I'm not going to mm. look at it. Mm. And the problem is, and this goes right back to school, we teach people mathematics, that's fine. We teach people economics. Mm. Britain doesn't need another economist. <laughs> no, last Hallelujah one. to yeah. that. We need to be taught some finance. And so mm. in maths, why don't we teach people actually how you pay a mortgage off? How you save for your pension? No, that would be much better. I seem to remember being taught at maths something about the logic of getting a fox, a ham sandwich and a chicken in a rowing boat across a river without them all eating each other. Now, so far in my life, I haven't come across a fix, fox, a ham sandwich and a chicken in a boat. Why did no one say, this is what you need to save yeah. over time with the joys of compounding and levels of risk, this is what you need to retire on? Yeah. And if you did that, then at least you take some of the fear away. Yeah. What our industry has to do is you can't make it entertaining, that's too flippant, but you can make it engaging, mm. which is why what you do is so riveting. Your clients love it. They love yeah. hearing what's going on. You've made it into something which is interesting and engaging. Yeah, that's, no, that's right. That's right. I mean, normally I, I, I just need to mention the pension word to put a whole auditorium to sleep. You yes. know, it's, it's amazing. So, uh, yeah, I think, as you see, you can't really make it sexy, but I think, if anything, the way things are going, for example, the changes in this year's budget, um, I think people are being forced to take ownership, but there's nothing in any of the legislation about how to educate them to take ownership. So, so, so I mean, you know, where do you think we need to go with this? Well, I'm going to take that a stage further. I'm, it's great what they've done. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure they thought it through altogether, but I would actually make savings, and it sounds awful, I don't like the state interfering, but make it compulsory from the year naught. 
so that people can have their own tax relief and yeah. you know grandparents and parents can give the child the money to, in a tax for efficient way and yeah. let it start growing as soon as possible yeah. um, but that's one side no what we have to do now is really start broadly educating people and the good news is actually technology is really going to help here um, mm -hmm. The bad news is, of course, people have the technology and they think, well, I can do it all myself. At some stage, you mm. are going to need some technical support about mm. pension rules, yeah. you know, inheritance, those sort of things. So there are, we're going to have to go and find trusted sources for it. And there are people like that, be good financial planners. Yeah. Uh, there are few and far between. Do you have to pay? Yes, you do. Um, but you don't necessarily have to pay the entire time and it doesn't have to be ludicrously expensive. Mm. And frankly, I would rather deal with a planner who can kick my accountant and kick my lawyer into action to yeah. coordinate things across the family yeah. uh, than necessarily having to deal with old-fashioned silo professionals who say they have a duty of care to their client. I can't think the last time my lawyer ever called me about anything. No, indeed, or, or, or my accountant comes yeah. to that. But, um, but yes, I, I think that, that there seem to be increasingly now you know, different uh, uh, vehicles, tax wrappers and so on. Uh, if you look at, say, pensions, they have become a bit of a political football in recent years with mm. the amount you can put in reducing and the, yep. the, your lifetime pot and so on. Um, has that put you off pensions a bit compared to, say, other vehicles like ISAs? Or? It, it's, it's constricted, but every time mm. I get a sort of get a beard in my bonnet about one, I realise, in fact, actually it's a combination of all these. Primarily, the first thing is save. Mm. That's what we've got to do, save. Yeah. Yeah. After that, it's a tax wrapper. And if you have a stale Mars bar in a nice wrapper, it's still a stale Mars bar. Yeah. So it's the saving and investing that's the important bit. Now let's try and find the right wrappers to put around it. And the answer yeah. is it could be the SIP, SAS pension structure, it could be the ISA, and the answer is you probably need a combination of them all. And the good news about the pension changes, at least it's making it more flexible. Yeah. And at least we heard the Chancellor under appreciating that it is, of course, it's our money, yeah. which a lot of the politicians seem to forget. That's We've right. saved for this money, so we should have the right to do something with it. Yeah. And their flippant remarks about going off to go and buy a Ferrari or something like that, that's just childish. What you need to then make sure is people do get access to good advice, but don't underestimate people's own ability to work quite a lot of things out for themselves. Okay. Now, you, you've been involved in the markets over quite a long period of time now. Um, what would you say has changed in that time? What do you think has stayed the same? There's been huge change. I mean, from yeah. the days going back to Big Bang, uh, no, prior to Big Bang, the gentleman, the age of capitalism. Mm. Look, hang on, it was racist, sexist, divided by religion, classist, depending where you came from. Apart from that, it was fine. Mm. Um, and of course, it was fixed commissions. You know, couldn't negotiate, and well, some would say fixed prices too. It was a cartel, mm. and like all cartels, was inefficient. We then broke that apart. So it goes from this period where it was all controlled into something which then becomes a meritocracy, which then swings too far the other way, with far too much greed being given with other people's capital, yeah. and we've seen the result of that explosion. So the answer is we've liberated that, now we have to learn again there's a right way to behave. And to me, that's important. It may sound corny, but you know, doing the right thing is the reason we started this business mm. for our own money. Mm. And I don't think that's very holy than thou. I just think that's the right way to behave. But I guess the, the fundamentals of, if you like, greed and fear are still there in human okay. nature, Absolutely. aren't they? So, so I, I read recently that, that um, DIY investors consistently underperform the market and they'd be far better off putting all their money in a tracker fund. Yeah, I mean, and it varies, of course. Yeah. I mean, I always love getting involved with the old investment clubs mm. uh, because it taught people <clears throat> about one part of investing, which was mm. just buying and selling shares. Yeah. Teaching them about building a broader portfolio couldn't really be done in that time. But mm. nonetheless, at mm. least it taught them something, whereas before nothing was going on at all. Yeah. What you've got now is investors have now got a far broader range of things to invest in, good news. Mm. Bad news is they've got a broader range of things to invest in because they've now got to work out what they all do, how they behave. Yeah. The good news is we've moved on from the world of the old IFA, many of whom weren't very high, provided FA, I suspect. <laughs> um, and, so, and also the old-fashioned stockbrokers uh, who were focused on, you know, I'll give you a bespoke portfolio, which was 80% in stocks, mm. of which the most of them, they normally covered about 40 stocks because that's all they knew. Yeah. And there were normally 20 purchases a year and 20 sales a year because at 40 transactions, you got your bonus. Brilliant, how did the portfolio do? I've no idea. That's no way to run it. Mm. So the answer is, we've now got a far greater range of flexibility in terms of products and services and facilities. Mm. Um, the industry's changed radically. 
Um, there are still nasty bits out there, but in my view, there are many better bits than there were before. So we've improved a great deal. Okay. The, we still get interference from the government, who don't understand A, how to run a business, or how to run finance, yeah. uh, but that's always the case. And regulators who've never been in the industry. So you spend your entire time butting up against them, yeah. trying to say, you know, actually, this is what we're trying to do and how we develop it, mm. as opposed to where we, in the old days, I remember with actually the, with the Stock Exchange and even with the Bank of England, you'd go along and sort of say, look, this is what we're doing and how we're going to work. You know, is, does, is that okay for you? And you'd get that sort of, not to say a nod, but at least it gives you some idea that these days people had some experience in what you were actually doing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, you touched on an interesting point there about um, basically diversification. Um, I think in my own experience, traditional IFAs have had this terribly narrow view of, of diversification. Uh, and I'm often banging the drum about my own view of it and meaning, meaning a much broader base across multiple asset classes. Uh, what, what's your view of, of, of a genuinely diversified portfolio? What sort of things would you expect to see in it? I will. I want to get away from the old stockbroking portfolio and the old stochastic models or sarcastic model <laughs> um, where you had, I saw some insurance companies used to produce these things and the uh, financial advisors in all good faith would populate these stochastic models of X percentages in that, that and that and that, mm. job done. Mm. Which meant that of course you had at some stage you had 25% in property when property was disappearing. But I've done my model so it's okay. And that's a bit like having a free and frank discussion with King Canute about tidal waves in the, in the English Channel. It's ridiculous. Yeah. No, to me, asset allocation, I keep it as broad as possible. I keep it as liquid as possible. So I want a table which has got 12 legs. So if two drop off, it's not a crisis. Mm -hmm. I can then, and this is where the metaphor breaks down a bit, adjust the legs. Yeah. So I can put more weight into one area, less into another. There are times when you can sit there and say, whoa, that's gone too far, let's ease off that. Mm -hmm. But not taking big bets because that's called betting. Mm. <laughs> but this is actually taking reasoned views and taking a medium-term view of life. Right. You know, I don't believe, if you're trying to invest, if anything less than three to five years is having a punt. I have no problem with having a punt, mm. but not with your long-term pension money or long-term investment money. So it needs to be treated with respect, mm. keep it broad, and it'll grow steadily over time. Mm. My view is that a good, well-diversified portfolio should after all costs, and I'm not talking about some of these other costs that everyone else brings in, now after everything, 7% a year. Right. If you can do that on a balanced basis, you double your money every 10 years. It could be dull, slow and steady, but if you mm. can do that over a mm. period when, there's, when the FTSE has been doing this all over, mm. that's okay. Because I think most of us want to have something which is as, no, not very volatile, don't frighten, frighten me, mm. make it as predictable as possible and make it something which is actually going to give me the reasonable returns which I had anticipated in whatever basic plan I had in my mind that I needed to achieve by a certain date. And, and, and do, you, do you achieve that through some process of asset allocation across mm. different types of assets? Uh... Yes, asset allocation. To me, there are, there are really primary two types. There's historical asset allocation, looking back at what has happened to everything from equities around the globe yeah. and all different shapes and sizes of equities, from, the, you know, from micros up to uh, large caps, uh, all the various different types of fixed interest. Interest. Mm. Uh, again, on a global basis, the commodities, the currencies, private equity, certain types of hedge. Um, all those, You can end up with 12 different types of asset classes very easily, mm. so long as I can trade them. What I don't want to be doing is to locked into areas uh, right. for any... I'll take a certain level of lock-in, but not too much, okay. because things change, stuff happens, and when yeah. stuff happens, I need to adjust it. Right, okay. Uh, and so, so that's, a, that's an ongoing process of saying... Uh, I mean, there are some people that take a view of kind of rebalancing that says, if, if I look at the end of the year and I'm up here and down there, I should buy more of this because it's cheap and sell this because it's gone up. I mean, do, do you do any of that kind no, of I don't believe in rebalancing at no. all. Rebalance, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's, it's a bit like some strange religious dogma. Now, yeah. here we are, we're coming up to halfway through the end of the year. We're going to the summer solstice. I shall go and grab some mistletoe and I shall go and stand next to Stonehenge. Right? <laughs> and I shall now rebalance my, my portfolio. I will now sell the asset class that's done well for me and I'll buy the asset class I dislike. <laughs> Why? Because it's disinvestment discipline. Well, so is an evening with Max Mosley, but that doesn't actually help your portfolio. <laughs> no, so what you've got to be able to do is, in my view, constantly stay within, uh, within given boundaries of, of movement of portfolios mm. in different risk profiles. Mm. So you're allowing that level of flexibility. You don't allow the investment creep to get a uh, defensive portfolio gets too risky. Mm. But rebalancing for rebalancing's sake 
is just adding extra cost, and it's dogma, mm. and I don't like that. No, what I want is historical asset, his strategic asset allocation, and then future view tactical asset allocation. Right. And what I do here is I have my asset allocation team, and in fact, I bring in you know, the great and the good, or the great or necessarily not so good, um, of people of a certain age. In fact, the most common meeting in the in a word in the meeting is actually what? <laughs> uh, to actually sit there and say, Actually, they've been through some of these before, like mm. the odd banking crash, mm. you know, the economic cycles. And not establish the future because I've got a lovely crystal ball. Yeah. Tell me where the holes are. Most investment goes wrong is when you make losses. Yeah. Now, actually, slowly, steadily going up, and that's fine. And the compounding, that helps. Then you suddenly find, whoa, there's a hole, you've disappeared down it. Avoid the holes. Yeah. So really what I want is my future tactical view is to tell me where the nasties are right. and then carry on with the asset allocation. It can be dull. I don't mind, though. No. If I can be saying to someone after you know doing seven percent on a balanced portfolio, if you want to take a bit something a bit richer, that's okay. Then we're doing the right thing. What got me so angry when the particularly in the noughties, after the year two thousand one, two and three, mm. going to sometimes companies where their pension manager was doing their big ta-da as to what's going on, mm. and suddenly seeing the portfolio dropping by fifty or sixty percent, and the portfolio manager says, "Well, that's what the stock markets do." And I remember getting very angry, saying, no, it's not. It's what you haven't done. Mm. Some really simple asset allocation would have actually prevented that. Yes, there will have still been some downtimes, but you'd have had something which is much steadier over time. Mm. And you wouldn't be looking people in the eye saying, I know you're about to retire, and I've just lost half your portfolio for you. That is irresponsible. Well, and, and also, I mean, in my own uh, case, that is the, the story that got me into taking personal ownership of my finances, oh, because um, I, my so-called wealth managers around the time of the NASDAQ boom mm -hmm. in the late 90s, um, it was great for a while. I was making, you know, every day I seemed to be three or four grand richer than I was the day before. And then, of course, it started heading south, and I was saying to them, well, shouldn't we be getting out of this now? No, 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 it's a temporary setback. You know, markets do this sort of thing. By the time I fired them in 2001, they'd lost me 150 grand. You know, and I, I, that was an expensive lesson, but uh, an important one. But one that, uh, you know, I have to say, is actually very common. Mm. Uh, I go around, and I'm, I want to point the finger at the private banks and certain other investment houses, mm. and they're still doing it. And some of them have layered charges. Yeah. And you know, our interesting, there's a great old Greek term, what is it, um, lying, um, where, you know, how much do you pay? You know, is it half percent? As I'll see from one private bank says they charge half percent. Well, that particular private bank, I've added through the costs of everything and the layering of their charges, mm. and it comes out at four wow. percent. Now, if I invested, uh, say, you know, I've got uh, you know, 10,000 pounds, and I'm investing this over 20 years, Okay, so mm. I've doubled my money, so I've got up to, up to, up to £40,000 at 7%, that's great. If I take off 1%, 2%, 3% 3 halves it. Mm -hmm. And most people won't realise that because they haven't got that in their mind, 3% is only that much, it's okay. Halves the value. Yeah. If it's 4%, it's wrong at 4% and it's wrong because you're not telling the truth. Yeah. That's bad behaviour. Absolutely. Now you touched on the importance there of being able to trade all the assets in a portfolio. Mm. Where does that leave you with your attitude towards property? Because property is, uh, everyone seems to think it's the saviour of, of pensions now. They're all thinking, ah, right, I'll, I'll get buy-to-let property. So what do you, what's your view of you know, investment in UK property as part of a portfolio? There's nothing wrong with some. We, and people should remember, you don't have to go too far back, it was an absolute dog, and not only was it you couldn't trade the thing, but it was actually going down in value. Mm. And here we are, and here people are saying again, it, there's only one way for property to go, really? Mm. Really? I mean, the only reason we're seeing it in London, actually, at the moment, is because we've got an awful lot of the Russians laundering, sorry, investing their money. Um, and uh, it is quite remarkable. Mm. It's, it's a false market. Mm. No, no. In terms of investment uh, portfolios, you need something which is tradable. Now, there might be a REIT, it might be a prior company, it might be a fund. So, yes, you want some exposure to it. Mm. And also, it depends on the different types. Do I want office? Do I want a commercial office? Do I want factory space? Do I want retail space? Mm. Um, and I think people, I can quite understand why people also want some buy-to-let, some domestic housing. Mm. That's fine, because it's something tangible. They understand, they can feel that. Mm. But the fixation with it, particularly with the tax incentives towards it, to keep on building up a portfolio, mm. no, 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 that was the road to doom. Okay. So on a, on a more personal level, what's the worst investment you've ever made? Oh, far too many to name. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, it's when I've invested in a, in a friend's business. Mm. You know, I mean, it's always a no-no. Don't do it. Because right. um, you're doing it for the best principles in the world, but he or she is the last person you can turn around and say, actually, that's rubbish, you're doing this the wrong way, because they're the friend. Mm. 
So I've done that a couple of times, and it's, it's really stupid. Um, so uh, no, that's one certainly to avoid. OK. And again, somewhat cheeky question. Do you, do you take any advice on your own investments, or do you just follow the, the, the process you do with all your other clients with your own money? Uh, all, Tom and I, Tom Sheridan and myself, set this business up for our own money. Uh, not that we had a huge amount of it, um, mainly because the previous employer had seemed to remove quite a lot of it, um, but the, uh, no, for, set it up to run it in the right way. So the investment processes that I run for my portfolio are yeah. exactly the same as my client's portfolio. So my balance portfolio will look virtually the same as somebody else's, Obviously, people will vary with their tax wrappers. People will have some other whims that they want to own as well. But primarily, what I wanted was consistency. Whether you had £1,000 or whether you had £5 million, the investment process should be the same. Right. Whereas what I used to find, of course, if you had £5 million, yes, sir, suits you, sir, that's marvellous. Well, I think we'll sell gold today. Meanwhile, the person with £1,000, I'll talk to you later. In fact, mm -hmm. I won't talk to you at all. You know, sit with your gold, doesn't matter. That's not the right way to behave. So you can actually standardise it but also then make sure there's enough flexibility so there's some tailoring for people for their individual needs, for their family. Okay. And that, I think, is one of the clues for the future. You know, we're in the baby boomers. When the baby boomers go, mm. you're going to get the baby busters. And they will sit there saying, well, I was going to get this money from my parents, but they seem to have spent it all. And they need to, be, need to spend even more time, actually, sitting there about their financial planning because they won't have the benefit that we've had of rising asset classes, yeah. those bulletproof pensions that were there, not anymore, and they are not going to see any of that. No, absolutely. And finally, uh, Justin, if I was to pin you to the wall with a gun to your head, what would be the one piece of investment advice you'd give to people watching us today? Someone did that to me once, uh, and I didn't come <laughs> up with any investment advice because I was too frightened. Uh, but no, what was the one thing I'd be doing? I'd actually be saying, if you're planning to invest, don't. Invest in planning. Do some planning about what you need to achieve by mm. when for you and your family. That will then tell you then what you need to do. Mm. I need to save money. No? How much I need to save? By when? But most of us don't even sit down and do that sort of basic plan. You run a business. I run a business. We have to have a business plan. Mm. For most of us, the only planning we did was probably the holiday, and that was about it. Right. If we could all do that, then at least would actually be a good start, as opposed to actually going off and having a punt on something. Okay. Don't mind having a punt, but get the plan done first. Fantastic. Justin Urquhart Stewart, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Us. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Justin Urquhart-Stewart, and it's my pleasure to have been asked, no, it's a privilege to have been asked, to actually give the keynote talk at this year's Graham Rowan's Wealth Summit in September. I'm going to be talking about what's happening in the world, what might go wrong, what hopefully is going to go right, and what we should all be doing in terms of our own investment portfolios. September the 13th, put it in your diary, look forward to seeing you there. Goodbye. If you want to make the smartest investment decisions, you need to be listening to the right people. That's why there's a very special event that needs to be in your diary now.